So, thank you, and I, I also would like first to, to thank the organizers for, for inviting me to, to give this talk and to be present at this workshop where I'm learning a lot. Um, and uh, I changed the title by adding brackets to the part of modeling because I'm not a modeler, so I, I cannot dare to speak about modeling. What I try to, to do is identifying fields or areas where modeling would probably help to understand better what's, what's going on with the diseases. Um, I also wanted to introduce you to, to my uh, working group, Sabio, Health and Biotechnology in, in Spanish. Uh, so we, we feel comfortable in, in this picture where we uh, work kind of in the overlapping areas between uh, pathogens, wildlife, domestic animals, humans, and uh, vectors. Um, and uh, well, for this uh, presentation, I will first uh, try to introduce a bit some, some, some ideas or some uh, simple uh, views of uh, wildlife disease aspects in Europe that, that uh, are of relevance in the, in the recent years. And then I would like to use two case studies. Uh, I liked very much the, the presentation yesterday uh, regarding the before, uh, the during the problem and the after the problem uh, visions. Uh, so I will, I will choose one for, for speaking about the during, uh, which is not classical swine fever, but African swine fever, because it's just in fashion right now in, in Europe, as you may know. Uh, and then for the after, I will again turn back to TB, uh, and I know it's a repeated subject in this, in this uh, um, workshop, but uh, still I think there are some, some, some more things to discuss regarding the understanding of, of uh, TB epidemiology. Um, so let's start with the introduction. Of course, in Europe, as everywhere, we have lots of diseases that are either of public health concern or of animal health economy concern. Um, and wildlife is often involved in these diseases. Uh, ungulates are probably among the, the most frequently uh, involved species, but birds, carnivores, lagomorphs, and others are involved too. So our field is, is, is really broad. And vectors participate quite often in, in, in the maintenance of these diseases or in the epidemiology of these diseases, so vectors should be considered also. Um, coming from Spain, one aspect of particular relevance is that we are uh, at the migratory route of birds in Western Europe, and we are also so close to the coast of Africa, we are just 14 kilometers from Africa, that uh, we can get and we do get uh, disease agents just by the wind or by um, human uh, movements. Um, <coughs> so this means we are very concerned in the southern part of Europe with emerging and, and new exotic diseases. Uh, one example is blue tongue, and uh, with blue tongue uh, in, in Europe we have been dealing with this uh, problem for quite a number of years. It was boosted in 2008 when, when the strain uh, uh, eight emerged in, um, in the Netherlands, in Central Europe, um, and essentially after doing a lot of epidemiological research in the field and some laboratory experiments, we gained the information that red deer under certain circumstances uh, with high densities are able to act as maintenance hosts for this, uh, not only for the disease, for the for, for blue tongue virus, but also uh, high densities of wild angulates including red deer, but also including wild boar and others, uh, contribute to the maintenance of Culicoides imicola, which is the main vector in our uh, region. So uh, we could have uh, just looked at uh, our partners in North America, asked you, what do you think about blue tongue? And uh, the, the policy here in North America regarding blue tongue is just, it's there in wildlife, <coughs> it's endemic, we accept it, and we live with it. Uh, instead of spending millions and millions and millions of euros in blue tongue control, which at the end is not working in parts of Europe. Yes, in the northern part of Europe it worked, and more or less we are now blue tongue free, but in the southern countries uh, where we have the highest deer densities and where we have the highest culicoides imicola densities, uh, we still have blue tongue running around, and particularly one, one strain, serotype 4, is still there. So this is kind of things we are learning with wildlife diseases. Another example, in this case of, of detection or of surveillance, uh, Leishmania, you usually link this to 
tropical, subtropical regions, and uh, mainly to dogs and may maybe wild carnivores or maybe uh, sometimes to a few other species, but never probably to hares. So suddenly in Madrid, two years ago, we had 240 cases, and the normal rate of cases in Madrid is like having two to four cases in a year. So it, it, it suddenly grew from these very few cases, these very occasional leishmaniosis cases in humans, to 240 in a, in a very short interval. When uh, people looked at the, at the problem, uh, they uh, linked it to a hunting ban of uh, hares. The local hare is the Iberian hare, Lepus granatensis. This increased the population. Uh, the population of hares was living very close to uh, human settlements and to dogs, and there was a cycle of leishmania. Uh, it was shown that hares were efficiently infected by, by the Phlebotomus uh, sandflies with leishmania, and that they were producing uh, enough leishmania uh, protozoa for continuing the cycle. And uh, when we looked for hares in different parts of the country, we realized that 45% of the hares were positive for leishmania DNA. Uh, so this, this went absolutely unnoticed until we had these huge outbreaks in, in, in humans. Um, so uh, essentially it is to show that even in Europe where we, we think we spend a lot of time and money and effort in dealing with wildlife diseases, we are not so ready to detect uh, early enough emerging diseases that are uh, shared with wildlife. But there are also very good things in Europe and we are very proud of this graph. This is uh, probably one of the single occasions where an intervention, uh, in this case vaccination, oral vaccination of foxes against rabies, efficiently controlled a severe, a serious uh, wildlife-related disease. And uh, you can see those arrows there. Uh, this is when the vaccination started in former Western Germany, and this is when Eastern Germany joined Western Germany, and uh, also the vaccination started there. So you can see uh, from about 10,000 cases of fox-related rabies, they went up to zero in, in a reasonable time. So uh, things can be done in, in uh, wildlife regarding disease control. It's not all lost. And the box of possibilities and of diseases is enormous, and there are so many things to speak about that we would uh, lose uh, too much time, of course, uh, that we don't have. So I want to focus on, on, uh, yeah, on these aspects of uh, before, during, and after uh, a disease. But I, I like to present it in another way. I, I think whenever we deal with a disease that is shared with wildlife, we have the following phases. We have first disease di discovery, we realize there is something. And once we realize there is something, we of course go for descriptive epidemiology and, and we uh, first uh, ask ourselves, is this disease relevant for humans or is it disease relevant for, for livestock? Uh, um, and if so, probably there will be some disease monitoring in humans and in livestock. Uh, regarding wildlife, uh, well, uh, if the, the wildlife is relevant for disease uh, maintenance uh, and it affects humans or livestock, uh, or if the disease seriously affects wildlife population dynamics, then eventually we will also start to deal with, with wildlife. So the, the point I want to make is that disease monitoring starts usually much, much more early in time in humans and in livestock than in wildlife. So our information on wildlife is usually poorer than the information that we have on the, on the domestic side of things. Um, then eventually we go for risk factor analysis and uh, depending on our identification of risk factors, we can eventually go to disease control actions, which would be the after phase, uh, as it was defined uh, yesterday. So um, we have a common problem, and, and I think already one possible output of this workshop would be a review on how modeling could uh, help in understanding what's going on globally with feral pigs and wild boar and, and uh, their uh, role in, in disease maintenance and disease transmission. Uh, but anyway, this is, this is our, our actor for the next uh, slides. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is the, fear, the first uh, uh, case study I want to, I want to present. Uh, these red dots represent African swine fever outbreaks. Uh, the dots represent domestic swine. And the triangles, you may not see so many, but there are a few over here and a few here and here. Uh, the triangles represent cases in wild boar. This is what we knew until 2012, 
uh, along during 2013, uh, there were a few more reports in these areas, including Ukraine and Belarus, and also the border of Russia with, uh, with the Baltic countries. Uh, however, most of the cases that are being reported in the last year and in the first months of this year are cases in wild boar. Now, we suspect that reporting <coughs> from the Russian side is not, and from the Belarusian side, is not very transparent. And uh, there may be a bias towards reporting more cases in wild boar than in domestic swine, for political reasons, as, as usual. Uh, anyway, what happened in this January is that we got the first cases of African swine fever in Lithuania and in Poland, so in two EU member states, which is a major shock for uh, our uh, union and of course for the for the livestock sector mainly for the for the pig sector uh, so we are in in this phase of virus detection oh shit what do we do <laughs> okay um, good so uh, Graham presented very nicely some some data uh, basic data on feral pig ecology and i would like also to introduce some data on wild boar ecology so you can see some some parallelism because it's it's really interesting to to know this first they are uh, very able to reproduce both wild boar and feral pigs regarding wild boar what we can estimate is in 200 percent annual increase <laughs> because they uh, produce a high litter size and they are able to reproduce even 1.5 times as a, on average in a, in a year. Litter sizes can be as high as seven point something per uh, birth, per, per, per liter. Um, more important than this, a very nice meta-analysis that has been done on like 13 or 15 places in Europe, in Central Europe, uh, including Poland and, and some other countries, uh, showed that the mortality, the natural mortality or the total mortality of wild boar is extremely low by combining a lot of radio tracking studies and uh, dealing just with the information on tagged animals that were found dead, uh, identifying the cause of death, they identified that hunting is almost the only significant cause of death. That natural mortality because of diseases plus road kill mortality plus other mortality is almost nothing in the, in the whole population dynamics. And that even hunting does only account for like a 20% or so, so at the end, uh, with this very high reproduction rate and this extremely low mortality, and this is a native species, okay, this is not an invasive situation, this is just native wild boar, we have growing but extremely rapidly growing wild boar numbers. And the result is what you see here. This is again a combination of hunting back results from different countries, mainly European countries, but there is also Japan in between. Just to show that the general trend is some, something like this. So we have an exponential or almost exponential growth of wild boar populations uh, that is mediated by a low mortality and by a very high reproductive capacity, plus all the habitat changes and the management changes that are taking place. So the message is we have a problem because we have African swine fever, tuberculosis, and many other things in our wild boar populations in different places. But the problem is going to grow, and it's not going to, going to stop. Uh, regarding movements, uh, there are also lots of studies uh, regarding the movement patterns of wild boar and in general, yes, the, the, the uh, home ranges are small, but there are two important points. One, uh, wild boar are really not very much affected by barriers, even by fencing. So you can see this kind of <laughs> uh, images or what you see here, the red line is a fence and this is the home range of a wild boar and you see uh, <laughs> she's not very concerned. Uh, and also an interesting point, uh, hunting will increase the movement rate. So uh, this is comparing animals in areas without hunting and in areas with hunting during the hunting season. And you can see the mean uh, distance moved was about 8,000 meters, so eight kilometers, uh, if hunting takes place, uh, and less than 1,000 if hunting doesn't take place. So increasing the hunting can also increase the movement rate, which is something to consider in models of disease transmission or uh, risks uh, related to control actions. Um, Movements can exceptionally be very, very extreme. There are cases reported in Europe of natural movements of wild boar of 250 kilometers. 250. This is very occasional. This is very rare. This is extremely, uh, you know, it's one in a thousand or one in a ten thousand. 
but it can happen. And the recent report uh, that was published uh, showed this pattern of a GPS collar saw with piglets that moved 100 kilometers through Slovenia until she reached the uh, frontier of Austria. And for some reason, she went back to Slovenia. She didn't like the Austrians, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> but it shows that the, the, the possibility of eventually transmitting something or carrying some disease agent over quite a large distance. Uh, another very important fact of wild boar and, of course, of feral pigs is that they are carrion consumers. So for certain diseases that may survive in carcasses, like, uh, for instance, African swine fever, this is very important. Remember that African swine fever, one of the best samples you can take for sampling African swine fever is bone marrow. And uh, the bones of a dead wild boar or of a dead pig may survive in winter with cold temperatures for a long time. And this bone marrow may have viable virus for a long time. If a wild boar goes there later and eats these remains, feeds on these remains, uh, the likelihood of, of uh, maintaining the disease in the population is, uh, is, 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 is over a long time. Um, then, interactions of wild boar with livestock are very important. How can we study this? We can use camera traps, uh, we can use contact loggers, or we can use GPS collars. And we have been doing this to, to make the story, the story very short and focus just on African swine fever. This is what we got through contact loggers. Essentially, the direct contacts between wild boar and pigs, even free-ranging uh, pigs, uh, these kind of guys here, um, are very low. You, you see the connections are very occasional and very very, uh, very small as compared to the peak-to-peak uh, -peak contacts, for instance. Uh, however, this picture shows you that contacts may occur. This uh, is not a wild boar. Uh, all these are pigs. They are sisters or brothers. What happened there is that the wild boar uh, mated a saw, a domestic saw. So there are contacts between pigs and wild boar, even if they are occasional, for sex or for food, as always. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> this is <laughs> more or less human behavior. Uh, OK. However, if you look at indirect contacts, uh, which may not be very important for African swine fever, but clearly are very important for tuberculosis or for classical swine fever or for some others, uh, indirect contacts at water holes, for instance, are extremely frequent. And you may see the same animal, uh, I mean, the same site. You see, this is the same stone uh, uh, just uh, some time after one each other. Uh, so this means that indirect contacts occur uh, extremely frequently, not only between wild boar and pig, but of course also between uh, wild boar and, and cattle and other uh, species. An additional factor to consider is that management of wild boar uh, is important, uh, as it is uh, the hunting management of feral pigs everywhere. Uh, this means uh, there is a big hunting industry with their own interests. This means that there are imports of animals by hunters. For instance, in Spain, we know about imports fr of wild boar from Hungary, of wild boar from Poland, of wild boar <coughs> from several other countries, uh, which implies some human-mediated risks of disease transmission. Uh, this also implies that there is a lot of feeding in the field for maintaining high-density populations, which in turn aggregates the animals, which in turn facilitates some other epidemiological aspects. There is a lot of farming. Uh, wild boar farms are in fashion, and they are making good money by selling big wild boar uh, uh, to, to the hunting estates. And of course, uh, uh, the management on the, on the big hunting estates, on the private-owned hunting estates that are commercial, is uh, more or less farm-like. But the difference is that there is no registry, there is no control, there is no proper censusing of these farm-like environments that are more and more and more uh, important. So what does this uh, oh shit and panic <laughs> crisis uh, tell us? Uh, first of all, that we really still lack a proper wildlife population monitoring. If, you, if we go out and look for information on wild boar populations in European countries and probably in many other places worldwide, we just have the information on the hunting bugs, and this is the best we can get. So we really need better tools or additional tools to uh, know better about what's happening with the populations. Another point is that we lack intervention strategies and protocols for wildlife. 
So what happened now in Poland and in, in uh, Lithuania shows us that we are really not prepared for what's going on, what's going to happen. There were proposals of setting up large barriers, uh, fencing out Russia and, uh, and Belarus from Poland and Lithuania just to avoid wild boars entering. That, this is something you can think in a, in a closed room, but not in, in the real field. Uh, and, and now I'm, I'm a member of the, of the panel of the EFSA, of the European Food Safety Agency, that is dealing with the questions that have been posted by some member states regarding the possibility of fencing as a tool for, for avoiding the problem uh, and also the possibility of uh, hunting wild boar intensely, killing 80% of the population in order to stop the, the, the progress of the African swine fever. Well, our, our answer, it's not ready yet, uh, uh, but uh, essentially, w first thing we tell them is, 80% of what? You don't know the population, so 80% of what are you exactly killing? And, and second, uh, uh, if you start killing so many wild boar, uh, you have several problems to consider. First, if you really manage to do so, you will create an empty place and you will just favor the immigration of new infected animals. Uh, second, for killing so many animals in collaboration with the hunters, you are probably feeding, you are baiting, you are doing a lot of things that are just contraproductive, that are just going against your, your goal. And third, we really don't know, we have no idea of the maintenance of the carrying capacity for African swine fever. We don't know which is the limiting uh, density. Uh, actually, until uh, three months ago, the big experts in African swine fever uh, always uh, had the, the uh, dogma that wild boar were absolutely unable to maintain the disease. The disease was just maintained by uh, domestic swine, domestic pigs, and occasionally wild boar may play as a spillover and may, uh, you know, uh, carry the disease to another place. Now, <laughs> the Polish and Lithuanian situation is just wild boar. There, in principle, has been no pig involvement, at least on the European side, on the, on the European Union side of things. Um, we don't know what happened in Russia, if it was swill fe feeding of uh, pig meat or if it was pig movements or if it was really wild boar movements or what. We don't know. Uh, but what we know is that wild boar seem to be involved. We have information that antibodies are being found in quite a number of wild boar in Russia. This means that uh, at least a few animals survive at least over 10 days to the disease, so mortality is not so acute. If mortality is not so acute, uh, there is a possibility that high density populations might contribute to maintain the circulation for some time. We don't know exactly the time. So there are so many open questions that we need to address and that show us how uh, embryonic we are in terms of understanding the disease dynamics of, of these kind of, of, of problems. Uh, and uh, regarding modeling, we really need to model wild boar demography, uh, considering aspects such as feeding, such as hunting, and such as disease-mediated mortality. Uh, I think we have some of the basic information, like mortality rates, like uh, reproductive rates, like uh, some other information on, on the possible effects of feeding on uh, reproduction or feeding on survival and things like that. Uh, I think it would be really, really interesting to get a model that shows clearly the stakeholders how, uh, what the effect of feeding, of artificially feeding uh, wild boar, for instance, for hunting purposes, what is the effect of this on um, the likelihood of those wild boar populations to maintain diseases such as African swine fever. Okay, so this was the, the first point. Now, uh, I want to make a second point uh, very shortly <coughs> on, on TB. Uh, again, with the, same, with the same player, you know, uh, uh, TB is uh, widely distributed worldwide and in Europe, all these places where you have uh, those shapes of animals, it means that the animal has been uh, found to be infected with uh, members of the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex. Where the shapes are black, like the badgers in the UK and Ireland, and like uh, wild boar and red deer in, in the Iberian Peninsula, we assume we have a wildlife reservoir. In all the other places, there is still discussion. Is there a reservoir or is it just spillover or what? But anyway, you see we have TB in, in uh, many sites. And uh, essentially, badgers, wild boar, and red deer are implicated in different places. Um, let's focus on the Iberian Peninsula, where I work and where I have more, 
more information and just give you one example on Montes de Toledo. Montes de Toledo is in the central part of uh, southern Spain, uh, south of Madrid. And uh, there we have been surveying uh, some populations of wild boar, both in protected areas, in public hunting areas, and in private hunting areas uh, over a long period, since uh, the year 2000, more or less. Uh, and what you can see is that the wild boar hunting bug that is pretty well recorded in this area, because all these wild boar go for meat consumption, they go for uh, <coughs> go to slaughterhouses and, and are exported. So there is an individual record of every single animal that is hunted, uh, shot, and, and uh, goes to the slaughterhouse. Uh, so you can see uh, the numbers of wild boar have increased uh, till doubling uh, themselves in just 12 years. So this means a 100% increase in just a relatively short time, which is reflecting what happens in many other parts of the world. So it's nothing very new. Uh, at the same time, unfortunately, our TB prevalence in wild boar rose from 50%, which is already quite a high prevalence, to 65%. Okay? So this means that uh, we are not only uh, the football champions, but also the TV champions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, not a nice record. Anyway. Uh, so regarding TB, there are many open questions uh, that we don't uh, understand well and that we need to address, uh, particularly regarding modeling uh, as a tool for answering part of these questions. One of the questions is the, the asymmetry in, sh in shedding. Uh, not all individuals are infected, some are, some are not infected, but not all individuals shed the same quantity of mycobacteria into the environment. These animals that shed lots of mycobacteria into the environment because they have very, very large lung lesions and, and this very severe disease. They are probably short-lived, but dur during their short li life span, they are able to contaminate a lot of other animals, including a lot of different species, not only other wild boar. And this effect may be seasonal. As uh, my colleague Joaquin Vicente has shown recently in a very nice paper that I recommend you to, to read in the Transboundary uh, Journal, a, there is a correlation between the annual, annual rainfall the season before and the number of wild boar with generalized tuberculosis in the season thereafter, meaning that in dry years with less food, with more aggregation at water holes, uh, uh, maybe because of body condition aspects, maybe because of contact aspects, we don't know, but uh, uh, whatever the way, there are more animals with a generalized tuberculosis, meaning that transmission is much more efficient and is much more likely to happen both intraspecies and between species after dry summers, after dry years. Okay? And we are in Mediterranean habitats where dry years happen every two or three years, so uh, this is something to take into consideration and that we don't know how to deal with, how to, how to treat uh, or how to, how to model. Uh, Another very important point that has already been shown, of course, regarding several diseases, including foot and mouth, we are in a multi-host uh, system. Uh, so actually what, what we have in, in, uh, in Europe in general is uh, different domestic hosts that can maintain mycobacterium bovis. We are always focusing on cattle, but we are f often forgetting about pigs, for instance, or goats, and they are there, and they can have TB and can shed TB quite efficiently. Hmm? There are recent data from the UK, for instance, regarding pigs that are quite, quite interesting, uh, or from Italy, assuming that they have a reservoir in the pigs in Sicily. Um, and regarding wildlife, we tend ourselves to focus so much on the wild boar that we sometimes forget about the other actors like red deer, fallow deer, badgers where they are, etc. So in, in reality, we have a complex system, and the more species that are involved, the more complex uh, and challenging the, the control. Uh, and this picture is uh, fantastic for showing this. This is a real picture uh, uh, using a camera trap. Here you see red deer drinking at the water hole. This is, of course, a cattle. And here you see a group of wild boar entering the same water hole. So uh, indirect transmission of TB is absolutely likely. In the mud of this kind of water holes, 50% of the samples, of the mud samples, test positive by PCR for mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, by PCR does not mean that it is viable, but if 50% are positive, I guess there are some viables among them. Hmm? Um, but there is another point. We all assume there are multi-host diseases, but what we tend to forget is that uh, we have 
also a multi-pathogen host, meaning that wild boar are not just exposed to TB, they are exposed to all these long list of diseases. Fortunately, we don't have some of them in our area, but we do have circovirus, parvovirus, uh, PRRS, uh, whatever, uh, hepatitis E, Aoyeski's disease, and so on and so on. So uh, the same wild boar can be exposed to seven viral agents, 10 or 12 bacterial agents, and lots of parasites that are not even listed here. And this must have some link to uh, the uh, behavior uh, and the pathogenesis of uh, the mycobacterium tuberculosis complex in this host. For instance, one very important point, we see much less tuberculosis in open areas than in farm-like uh, environments in, in these uh, intense hunting estates. But this is not tuberculosis, this is circovirus. Why, why I'm showing you this? Because uh, circovirus prevalence is, of course, much higher where the density of animals is much higher. That's no surprise. Circovirus is a directly transmitted disease that benefits from aggregation and from, uh, from uh, um, uh, big populations. Okay, but the important point is that if you go to open areas, few of the piglets have had contact with circovirus. But if you go to these farm-like areas, 80% of the piglets have already had contact with the circovirus. What does it mean? Circovirus is an immunosuppressing uh, viral disease. If you have this immunosuppression and then get in contact with Mycobacterium bovis or, or any other member of the complex, maybe your clinical development of the lesions is different than if you don't have the previous uh, viral challenge. In fact, we studied wild boar tuberculosis in northern Spain areas, and colleagues are studying them also in France and in other parts uh, outside the main, the core TB area. What we are finding is that uh, in those places, circovirus prevalence and the prevalence of other pathogens is far lower, and the proportions of animals with lung disease, with severe lung disease, likely to excrete lots of mycobacteria is far lower while in, in our core areas, Montes de Toledo, for instance, uh, the prevalence of circovirus is very high, and the proportion of animals with lung lesions is up to 50%. So maybe the co-infections are actually a very, very important driver of the whole system. So we should not forget about the multi-host nature of these diseases. We should also not forget about the multi-pathogen nature of these infections. Okay, this is a very important point regarding modeling because it changes possibly the number of, of different models and it makes it much more complicated, I, I see. <laughs> well, uh, of course, we are dealing with an endemic disease and there are lots of different intervention options. Uh, we have no time to go through it, but essentially we can work on improving the biosecurity at the interface. We can play around with fencing, for instance, fencing the water holes, fen fencing the feeding sites and avoiding the entering, entry of, of uh, one species or the other. Uh, we can do wildlife population control. Essentially, it is a game species, so we can intensificate hunting and try to reduce the population in this way. Uh, we can decide about compartmentalization or similar things or zonification, saying, OK, in this range we are accepting the STB and we are doing nothing because it's just not cost effective. Or we can go for vaccination. And we are uh, more or less playing around with all the different tools and having some interesting information on all these tools. But what we do need is some uh, support regarding modeling uh, to assess not only the efficacy of the single tools, but particularly to make prospective research on what would happen if we combine different tools, uh, if, if, if merging two or three different tools would really improve our success, our likelihood of success in uh, improving uh, our, our results. And of course, we need to assess in any way the, the uh, control decisions that we are, that we are making. Uh, so, I'm coming to the, to the end. What does the, the TB part uh, story uh, tell us? Um, I think we, we need to consider realistic systems, and realistic systems mean <coughs> multi-host and multi-pathogen, not just single pathogen or single host. Um, we need to consider shedding. There is an imbalance in shedding, and, and this is something that happens in many different <coughs> pathogens, so it clearly should be included in, in the modeling efforts. Um, we need to model the efficacy of intervention strategies, both single and combined, 
and also we really need to uh, assess the cost-benefit balance, which is something that we tend to forget about uh, because uh, the money comes from research, not always from the industry, so we are not so much concerned about the, the cost, but at the end, if we want this to be used at the broader scale, we really need to know uh, the cost and the, and the effectiveness. And uh, that's all. Thank you very much.